I breached the door to my room. It swung open to the right. I followed the door in as it opened, looked down the right wall, and saw that it was clear. As I pivoted off my right foot to move down the left wall, I had the sensation that my body was being slammed with a dozen sledgehammers. My entire body was now in the room, and the men behind me in my room clearing train were attempting to follow me in. The room was small, 12 feet by 12 feet. My night vision goggles illuminated the darkness, and I saw in clear view four of our targets aiming at me, all of them armed with automatic weapons and all of them firing at me. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to be going over the unbelievable story of the Navy SEAL who survived being shot 27 times. This, of course, is none other than the legendary Navy SEAL Mike Day. We're going to be going over his first-hand account of the mission through his book, Perfectly Wounded. I'll have a link down in the description below where you guys can go check it out. Now, I do a lot of book recommendations here on the channel, but I am actually not going to recommend you buy this book. I am going to beg you to buy this book. Full disclaimer, I am not done with this. I've only read about halfway through the book, but genuinely, it is probably the best book I've ever read in my entire life. I am shocked by how incredible and moving this book is. I literally can't say enough good things about it. Buy this book immediately. Also, guys, the reason we're making this video now and reading through this story specifically right now is because on March 27th, 2023, which I don't know exactly when I'm going to be able to post this video, but at the time of me recording this was just a few days ago. Mike Day unfortunately passed away. So I wanted to make this video in honor of Mike Day and all that he's done for this country and just to make sure you guys are keeping his family and friends in your prayers. And with that, guys, let's jump straight into this incredible story. April 6, 2007, 1.33 a.m. We arrived on target undetected. Our breacher identified a possible location on the compound where we thought our guy might be held up. A breacher's sole mission is to reach the other side of any barrier, whether it's a door or a wall or a fence. His methods include mechanical, ballistic, explosive, and thermal breaching. Sometimes I would just turn a doorknob and walk into the room, or go around a thick wall and enter through an open gate. We once had a target we'd visited three different times over a period of several months. And sure enough, on all three missions, the key was in the lock. All I had to do was turn the key, unlock the door, and walk in. I found it totally bizarre that the occupants of the home left a key in their locked door. But as long as you get to the other side, it's still considered a breach. We were split into two groups. One covered the outside area and the other moved inside to cover the doors and clear rooms. Our breacher surveyed the entry door then mechanically opened it. The door popped open and a group of my SEAL teammates poured into the room. We had practiced this technique of room clearing for years. We moved without thinking. The room was empty. It was a prayer room with only one way in and one way out. My radio broadcasted the information into my earpiece. Short room. This was the signal that the target was not there because there was no other doors inside this room that led to other parts of the house. The breach team needed to get out fast and breach another door. As one group exited the short room, I stood by the door to a foyer. I donkey kicked the door to the foyer to open it and my room clearing train followed me in. To get to the entrance of the foyer, we had to pass through an outdoor carport covered by a sheet metal roof. Clark Schwedler, who a few days before had been rocked by an IED blast driving to this same target, had been the first man into the prayer room. He ran out of that room, through the carport, and into the foyer, where he saw that I was holding security on two different doors. Clark quickly set up on the second door, located diagonally across from me. He was loaded down with extra weight as he was hauling around all our intel gathering gear. These were the types of compounds where we would often find gruesome video evidence of what the people we were hunting had done to women 
and little boys and little girls while they made their family members watch. Our Iraqi scouts and SEALs followed Clark's lead and split off my room clearing train to fill in behind him to create a second room clearing train. Less than 30 seconds after entering the first room, Clark was at the front of another train ready to clear another room. Clark's door was located directly across from my door and the angle was such that a straight line could be drawn connecting the entryways of both doors. Through the open doors you could see the far corner of one room from the far corner of the other room. It was pitch dark. However, the yellow glow of a gas lamp pilot in the corner of the foyer provided more than enough light to fuel my night vision goggles. I could see everything clearly. I was the number one man on the door in my train, which meant I would be the first man into the room. Missions often included debates as to who would get to go first. All these guys were fearless and liked to train hop to the front of the stack, the most dangerous place to be, first into a room. Seals love to fight. We all want to be the first into the fight and every seal is willing to accept the greater risk especially for his buddy's sake. I had no apprehensions about the possibility of my own death. My concern was for my platoon mates. While I can't speak for everyone, their actions this night proved they all felt the same way. Clark and I looked at each other and he smiled back at me. We had practiced this maneuver a thousand times and had successfully done it on hundreds of missions just like this one. There was no rush of adrenaline or anxiety. We were composed relaxed, and professional. We would simultaneously breach our respective doors and go to work clearing the rooms of enemy fighters and other potential threats. We launched on the signal, a mutual wave of our rifle barrels. I breached the door to my room. It swung open to the right. I followed the door in as it opened, looked down the right wall, and saw that it was clear. As I pivoted off my right foot to move down the left wall, I had the sensation that my body was being slammed with a dozen sledgehammers. My entire body was now in the room, and the men behind me in my room clearing train were attempting to follow me in. The room was small, 12 feet by 12 feet. My night vision goggles illuminated the darkness, and I saw in clear view four of our targets aiming at me all of them armed with automatic weapons, and all of them firing at me. It was surreal, like something out of a movie. Time slowed almost to a stop, and everything happened in super slow motion, almost as if I were watching the scene unfold frame by frame. Seconds seemed like minutes. A slow motion torrent of bullets flew at me. I could clearly see all the bullets coming at me, I had total auditory exclusion. There were no sounds. I had never been shot before, so I had no idea how it felt. In this strange slow motion scene, I had a mental conversation with myself, and it occurred to me that those sledgehammers smashing all over my body were bullets hitting me, one after another. It was in that moment I said my first real prayer, God, please get me home to my girls. My wife and two young daughters were halfway around the world. In that instant, I felt them, and they felt me. It felt like I was a bullet-dodging character in the Matrix, only I wasn't dodging any of the bullets. They were hitting me. My rifle was shot out of my hands, bullets whizzing past my head hammered into the men entering the room behind me, even as I continued to penetrate down the left wall. Nobody else in my train would be able to make entry, as all four of the enemy continued to fire directly into what is known as the Fatal Tunnel, the dimly lit doorway in which I was standing. War shifts from a natural interest to an extremely personal one. This shift happens at the precise moment enemy bullets are directed at you and not at a theology or a country. It's also at this precise moment when self-preservation becomes the overriding objective. When bullets start flying and men are dying, nobody is thinking about God and country. Our thoughts are about our loved ones at home, the guys beside us, and ending the fight. I suspect that during these violent episodes, the enemy thinks and reacts much the same way. In the violence, we become more human, more ruthless, and more alike than we are different. Survival is all that matters. 
In the savagery, our involuntary responses are powered by our respective nervous systems. This internal fight or flight ecosystem has been installed in the most ancient part of every brain over the course of human evolution, and our reactions are governed by primal survival instincts. The enemy bullets triggered my rage and drove me to act. It was then that my body became my mind and took over. I suppose that's what a habit is. When the body overrides the mind and acts without specific instructions from the brain. My right hand instinctively reached down for my secondary weapon, a pistol. My hand was on autopilot as it unhooked the rubber strap I had fashioned to keep my pistol secure. And with a fluid forward push and pull, the very same motion that I had done a hundred thousand times in training, my weapon released from my holster. I aimed my pistol and engaged the enemy fighter directly opposite me down the left wall. He was glaring at me, with his weapon throwing rounds directly at me. I returned fire, four or five rounds from my weapon caught him in the face and chest as he stared at me. His head jilted back. I saw the life leave his eyes like a light going off. I knew he was dead as he melted into a pile in front of me. I landed next to the dead man on my left. Years of training and muscle memory without any direct orders from my brain lifted my arm, arched it, and aimed my pistol at a young male figure, maybe in his early 20s. As he stood up and moved toward the doorway, I was still on the floor when I watched him pull a hand grenade from the front of his vest and pull the pin. My right hand pointed at him and my index finger squeezed to the trigger. I saw the bullets exit my pistol and spin clockwise as they flew toward him, leaving a green vapor trail in their wake. I watched my bullets punch into one side of his head. An exhaust of blood and brain matter instantly exited out the other side. I shot him dead as he attempted a suicide mission to run out into the foyer with a live grenade where my fellow SEALs and Iraqi scouts had stacked up, attempting to enter the room. My rounds dropped him in his tracks. As he fell forward, I saw the grenade release from his hand and roll toward me. Then it detonated. One of our newly arrived SEALs from Team 10 was outside under the carport looking into the room's only window when he saw my bullets hit the enemy in the head. He watched as the enemy fell. Then the grenade blast shattered the window, spraying shards of glass into my teammate's face. This was his first mission in Iraq. What a way to start a new job. The grenade blast knocked me unconscious. When I woke up a few minutes later, I was fully lucid and lying on my left side, looking across the room at two men. Both were firing their weapons over my head out the window directly above me. The grenade blast had twisted my helmet, rendering my night vision goggles unusable. The light from their muzzle flashes and the dim glow of the gas lamp in the foyer were enough to clearly illuminate the men standing no more than 10 feet away from me. I heard no sounds. It was totally silent. I was in a very bad place in the middle of a gunfight. If the enemy caught a glimpse of me glaring up at them, all it would take to finish me off would be for both of them to point down, pull their triggers, and unload high velocity bullets into me. If I could clearly see them, then they could see me too. For an instant I thought about playing dead, but in that same millisecond before the thought could be fully evaluated, my anger rejected it outright. I had never been so angry. A feeling of determined, ruthless rage. It seemed to be stored somewhere deep inside me, and something just snapped. In that moment, my rage consumed me. My world closed in, and nothing else mattered to me but destroying the two men still standing in front of me. I would fight back and kill them before they killed me. I didn't know it at the time, but while I was laying unconscious on the floor, two of my SEAL teammates were still outside the door of the room trying to get a shot on the enemy. Two of our Iraqi counterparts were the only eyes that saw me enter the room. In the chaos that ensued, they were unable to communicate my location to anyone. The volume of fire coming from the room through the door and out of the window was so excessive that there was no way anyone else was getting into the room. The team decided to pull everyone back and call in an airstrike to neutralize the target. And me with it. 
As the team pulled back from the house, Connor, my other SEAL teammate, was shot and wounded by one of the two remaining enemy fighters firing over my head out the window. While I lay on the floor, my teammates worked their radios, calling for the status of each other and what was going on in the house. I heard nothing. As the remaining elements of my assault team departed the house and moved to a safe dropping distance from the target, I was laying on my left side with my pistol still in my right hand. Just like before, my arm reached up and aimed at one of the men standing in front of me and my finger pulled the trigger. I couldn't hear the gunfire, but I felt my hand jump. Rounds exited my weapon and I watched the projectiles fly in slow motion as they punched into his body. Small holes burst open in the fabric of his shirt where my bullets entered. His face contorted into a bizarre combination of surprise and pain. More surprise than pain. In less than five seconds, I ran a magazine dry and completed a magazine change before the two enemy fighters figured out that I was still alive and shooting back at them. My bullets drew their gunfire away from my departing teammates. Their full attention and bullets were then directed back at me. I still don't have any explanation as to why I moved my magazines from my left hip to the webbing in the front of my vest, but it saved my life and possibly the lives of many others that night. I was lying on my left side, which is where I normally carried my extra magazines, on my left hip. They would have been trapped under me if they had been in their usual location. The enemy fighters were now both so close to me. I remember the stunned look on their faces as they pointed their weapons at me and fired back. A round from one of their AK-47s struck the bottom of my pistol and dislodged my gun's magazine. My pistol jammed and I felt the gun's grips crumble in my hand. Another enemy bullet sailed clear through the foot of my magazine. I opened my hand slightly to release the shards of broken plastic that were once my pistol grips. The grips seemed to absorb the shock, shattering like an armor plate. I was fortunate to have this type of weapon. Another model may have been smashed to bits or been shot out of my hand. My palm was now pressed against the gun's internal springs. The bullets that struck my pistol caused my weapon to malfunction. I squeezed the trigger, but nothing happened. I quickly cleared the malfunction with a tap of the bottom of the magazine to firmly reinsert end of the pistol. A rack of the slide, then I squeezed the trigger. I had done this tap, rack, bang malfunction drill so many times that it happened automatically. All the while, I was still being shot at from no more than 10 feet away. An instant later, well before the human brain could process what and how it had happened, my hand aimed my pistol at the other man standing across from me and my finger squeezed the trigger. I saw rounds twisting as they exited my pistol flying toward him and entering his body, and then a round tunneled into his face. I emptied that magazine into both men as they crumbled to the floor in front of me. I loaded my last magazine into my damaged pistol. I was lying on my left side, leaning against the man who I first shot when I entered the room. I pushed myself up with one hand and reached behind with the other, placing my pistol against my dead enemy's motionless body and fired several more rounds. Seconds later, all four enemy fighters were silent. Their dead bodies lay in pools of their own blood and piles of spent bullet casings. A metallic odor flooded the room. Blood and urine leaked from their bodies onto the floor. I knew that I had been shot. I felt heavy, like there was a few hundred pounds sitting on my back. It was difficult to breathe, but the fight was not over, and the worst battles were yet to come. Amazingly, despite his injuries, Mike Day managed to clear the rest of the structure and rescued six women and children inside before walking away under his own power to a waiting medevac helicopter, where he began the fight of his life. He was evacuated first to Baghdad, then into Germany, and finally to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. In the hospital, he lost over 50 pounds in two weeks. It took the former senior chief nearly two years to recover from the physical wounds of that day, but the pain never entirely went away. His invisible wounds, PTSD, and a traumatic brain injury stayed with him for the rest of his life. 
His career in the Navy spanned 21 years. In addition to the Silver Star, he was awarded two Bronze Stars, one with Valor and a Purple Heart, along with several other accommodations. Following his service, he became a well-known author and advocate for wounded veterans. He also continued to train special operations forces and law enforcement personnel as a tactical training instructor. In addition, he was the founder of Warrior Tribe, a nonprofit organization offering resiliency training resources for veterans and trauma survivors. Mike Day, it is a genuine honor to share your story here today in this video. Thank you so much for your service and for your sacrifice, and thank you for being such an incredible role model for young men like myself to look up to and to strive to be like. You will be dearly, dearly missed. Thank you guys so much for checking out this video. Like I said, make sure you go down in the description below and buy Mike Day's book, Perfectly Wounded. It is incredible. But I hope you guys will have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much again for watching the video, and I will see you all in the next one.